appreciate it. I'm going to give away uh, some books again today, so look at your bulletin, grab it, flip it over on the back. I numbered uh, five bulletins, one through five, and so instead of taking the first one today, I'm going to, it should be at the bottom right-hand corner, I'm going to, um, so let's see, Lane, give me a number one through five, unless you have it, and then you can't do that, okay? Which, which number you want, one through five? Three. Anybody have number three? Number three. All right. Come on up. Yeah. There you go. First time here and you get a, get, uh, get a gift. Can't be that. And inside there is also a, um, two tickets for uh, the code for two tickets for our marriage conference coming up in April. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. And uh, also I meant to tell um, Brittany and Travis, uh, yours was supposed to include that as well. So remind me of that and we'll make sure we get you that coupon code uh, on that as well. And so uh, we're excited about this marriage conference coming up. It's going to be great. And it's just, uh, if you've been to a marriage conference, you know, just um, when you're sitting there with other couples and the children are out of the room and you kind of get that space just to reflect and, and think about, uh, you know, your marriage and what's working good, what needs tweaking. And it's just a, it's such an encouraging time. And had a uh, coffee with Chris Beam, uh, who runs a counseling center the other day. He's going to be a part of this and help, he and Sonia are going to help us out. I, I just volunteered. Sonia, is that all right? Uh, I don't think I asked her officially, but um, Chris is going to help us with that and, and, and be here available as well. And so it's going to be a, a really great weekend. You know, I know you're, you might be tempted to think, wow, you know, a whole weekend, a whole weekend on marriage, wow, that seems like a lot. Well, many of you travel around with your kids for sports, and you, you, you kill weekends all the time with baseball or basketball or something. To invest in your marriage, don't you think it's so much more valuable than a sport? And so I want to encourage you to um, pencil this weekend or write this weekend in. Mark your calendar. It's going to be Friday night and then Saturday till 4 or 4.30. And so just block that time in. It's going to be an awesome time, great time for our church family. Um, it, a couple guys were reading a book together, and the book is by Ed Welch, and it's called When People Are Big and God is Small. I want to read you a couple quotes from this book. It says, when we spend time in the throne room with God, it puts things in perspective. The opinions of others are less important, and even our opinions of ourselves seem less important. We tend to see ourselves as people who need something from somebody if we are going to change. And in the book, he, set, he represents our needs as kind of like a cup that needs to be filled. And he says, whether we realize it or not, we walk around in the relationships that we're working, people we work with, our employer, our spouse, we're always trying to get our cup filled by something or someone, love and acceptance. And so what we do is we look to people to fulfill what only God can fill for us. And so let's say Adam back here. I walk back to Adam and I say, Adam, man, how you doing, man? You know, and I begin to talk to Adam and I, I'm asking Adam to recognize me, give me approval, give me acceptance, fill my cup. And when he gives me the feedback that I like or he gives me the affirmation that I'm looking for, then I feel good. I'm like, oh, man, that feels great. That feels awesome. And we go through life and we look for people to fill that. You know, I look at Bo over there because he's awesome because he isn't, hold your cup up. His is, his is awesome because it's an orange cup, all right? And so I'm like, Bo, man, he's special. I need to get over here, Charlie, to Bo, all right? Fill my cup, man. What? Too busy for me? Man. And I feel terrible because Bo didn't give me what I needed. And what only God can provide, I'm looking out here instead of looking to God. And I feel empty. Go to Michelle, you know, my wife. You know, she, I know you got seven children this week. <laughs> you got some for me? That's all? You gotta, you gotta be kidding me. Can't believe that. Can't believe that's all. In our mood, our temperament, we get depressed, we get discouraged. I know Seth, man. He, he's got me, right? Come on, man. Give me some love. Me, oh, yes. Thank you. And that'll help me for a few moments. But until the next discouraging situation or the next rejection comes along, and then the cup's empty again. And we walk around and we try to get our cup filled by people. And Paul t is going to tell us today in this text, he's going to tell us that we can't be held bondage by people. We can't be slaves to people. In fact, 
which may seem odd for those who may not be a believer or a committed believer, he says we're slaves to God. We're bond servants to God. And so that means that God owns us. But here's the amazing thing is when we trust God and we look to God to fill our cup, he's looking out for our best, for his glory, and he's going to put us in situations and circumstances that we can minister for his glory. And in that moment where we're giving, not looking to take, but to give, is where our cup fills full. And we find our significance in the story of God rather than the story of ourselves. And so in verse 23, I'm going to start with the last verse. We're going to pray, and then we'll go through the entire passage. The last verse of, of, that we're going to look at today, verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. Don't become slaves to men, but understand that God is in control and be slave to him. Let's pray, and we'll look at this text today. Father God, I thank you so much for your word that gives us truth, that gives us life, that gives us direction. And God, we all know in our hearts that looking to people to give us something that only you can give us will never, ever end well. It will never satisfy. Yet we run to that again and again and again. God, I pray today will be a day where we truly in our hearts understand that we need to seek you and see that our identity rests in you before anyone or anything else. We, God, we thank you that you can be trusted, that your sovereign will can be trusted, that you can control the events and circumstances of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Mitch, before we look at this passage, would you go flip the light on back there for us so we can see the Bibles? So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17 through 24. 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 24. So if you're looking at your Bible, I'll give it a second for the light to come on. I know those with digital. You know, I used to be so pro-digital on everything, but Michelle got me this Bible a few um, months back, and it's a Bible with a lot of wide margins in it so that I can write uh, in the margin notes and things that I come across that God just was really revealing, application, things I, that other preachers say that I want to write down and jot down. And, and here's the thing. You know, if you read your Bible consistently, a lot of times you just fly through it or you just go through it. And, and really, a lot of times you don't gleam a lot from it. One reason that we like to do things like this, it slows us down. It causes us to think and, and it reinforces just like those who are in education. You know, if you write something down, you're more likely to remember it. And then, you know, just while we go through books of the Bible, while we go through passages of the Bible is because it helps us to slow down to a passage of Scripture and really allow that passage to fully speak and understand what God is trying to get through to us. Because you read a passage like 17 through 24, chances are most of you would read this and walk away with very little life change because you're like, oh, I don't really understand how that really makes a difference in my life. But it's amazing God's word is, is relevant to us in so many different ways. So let's look at verse 17 through 24 of chapter um, 7. Paul says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is my rule for all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at that time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Verse 20, each one should remain in the condition which he was called. Were you a bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself to that opportunity. For he who has been called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freeman of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bond servant of Christ. Verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. You know, one of the advantages of going through a book of the Bible and, and just taking your time through like a chapter like 7 is you really, really get to see all the detail there. But one of the disadvantages could be you forget the big picture, the bird's eye view of what Paul is giving to us. And so today, um, it's kind of to me seem weird that all of a sudden he starts talking about circumcision and he starts talking about slavery when he was talking about marriage and sexual relationships and singleness and all these things. And so it's, it's easy to miss the big picture and wonder what he's doing here. But he's using these things, and we're going to see in a minute, to illustrate the bigger picture. And the bigger picture, which we've been saying for a couple of weeks, is this. 
you don't need to change your status when you come to Jesus in order to follow Jesus. You don't need to become something that you're not in order to follow Christ. He says, remain where you're called. And this passage is, is so in our face as modern people because it challenges us in, uh, in our area of in, in our individualism, which is so held up in our culture, which tells us, keep pursuing more and more and more. Achieve. You can do it. And it tells us to be somebody, culture does, that we have to become a greater and greater person with more resources, more control, more power, and, and more money. But this is not what God tells us in his word. In fact, Paul says, he gives guidelines for the churches, and he says that I don't want you to base your identity on what you achieve, but I want you to base your identity on who you are in Christ. And the important thing is to obey God in whatever context you're in. No matter what situation you're in, God has called you to be obedient and follow him in that situation. And so you remember the Corinthians were responding to a lot of immorality in their culture. We think our culture was bad, but during their time, their culture was just riddled with sexual prostitution, sexual immorality. It was all around them. And so as they started to serve God and follow God, they, some of them took the, the stance that, hey, my body, it's, it's evil. My soul is the only thing that matters. And so I can just treat this body however I want. So if I want to go and just indulge in the pagan activity, I can because my soul is protected. And so some people erred on that side, but then you had other people who erred on the other side, which was they felt like that they could... Uh, they should just abstain from anything that had to do with pleasing the flesh, pleasing the body. And so you even had married couples, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, married couples who thought, is it more spiritual that we just don't have sex with one another because that way we can devote our attention upon God? Couples were asking Paul, should we divorce so we can focus our, our, our passion on him rather than on one another? And Paul, we talked about, I won't re-preach those sermons, but he said, look, if you're single... It's okay. Stay the way you are if you feel compelled to. If you don't feel like it's God's will to get married, if you feel like you have the gift of celibacy, serve God in that way. He said, if you're, if you're married, stay married. If you're married to an unbeliever, stay married to the unbeliever as long as they will stay with you because it, this is what I want you to do. This is the guidelines I give for the church because the big picture, again, he's making is no matter what situation you're in, God can use you for his glory and for his honor. And so Paul said, don't feel any pressure to conform or change. Stay where you are. And so when he talks about these areas that we're going to mention here specifically in a minute, you, we fail sometimes to see the background on why Paul would be talking about these things because we fail to see the impact that Christianity had on the Roman world. The Romans ruled the world at this time. And the, when people became Christians, it was something that the world had never seen. What was different about it? What was different about it was that people who were poor or rich, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, all of these people were welcome to worship together and be one in Christ. In fact, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. If you want to put that one up there, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so he said, in Christ, there's no differentiating between a free person and a slave. You're one. You're one in him. And, and you know, during Judaism, men were esteemed and women were looked down upon. And he said, look, there's, there's equal in Christ's eyes. We're equal in Christ's eyes. There's no hierarchy. But with this equality came some misunderstanding and some problems practically within the church. There was envy, there was confusion, there was misunderstanding. And so Paul makes it very clear in verse 24. He says, serve faithfully where you are. Serve faithfully where you are. So look at verse 24. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him re there, there let him remain with God. Whatever condition, there let him remain with God. You get that? He says, hey, if you're a farmer, now you're a farmer with God. You have God. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. You're not just the same guy you were before. All of a sudden, God indwells you, and it changes your perspective. Your circumstances don't change, but your whole outlet changes. 
If you were a stay-at-home mom before, all of a sudden now you're a stay-at-home mom with the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And so the activity and the actions that you did before, obviously you keep doing those things, but you do those with a whole different mindset now. That you don't just raise your children to be decent citizens who will make a, a good living in this world, but you raise those children to honor God and glorify God in all they do with their lives, a living sacrifice. And so Paul wants them to know that there's a huge difference, but the difference isn't you get picked up from here and moved over here and all become some, you're transformed into something different. You're still the same person you were before working the same job and the same occupation, but now you do it with God. And so he says, look, don't look to just exchange your, your situation. There's nothing wrong with changing our jobs or moving to a new location. But the point he's making is you don't need to do those things in order to be closer to God or more in touch with God. So let me ask you the question. Have you ever thought about this? If only blank then I could serve Jesus better. If only blank would happen in my life, then I could better serve Jesus. I mean, think about it, honestly. Think about it for yourself. Think about the things that you tell yourself, the reason why you're not being more of a servant to others, that you're not sacrificing your life for him, why you're not doing things for the kingdom. Because we all make excuses. There are usually things like, well, if only I could win the lottery, then I could just... Like, so advanced the kingdom, you know? Amazing that person gave four or $500,000 to your ministry there. And we think things like that. And we think, if only I had those resources, man, what a difference I could make. Or, you know, if only I had a different job where it was just so much better and maybe more Christian community and more Christians who were on the same page as me, then I could serve Jesus better. Or, you know, if it wasn't for the stage of life I'm in or if I had better health. And so we come up with all these things that sometimes seem very legitimate. But the truth is, Paul says, look, when we're tempted to think that a change in our circumstances is going to take care of the problem, it's going to be the answer, we, don't, we forget that the answer, the problem is most of the time us. It's not the circumstances or situations around us. We're tempted to think that a change in our circumstances is always the answer to our problems. But our greatest problem is most often within us, not around us. And so we talked about this when we talked about marriage and divorce. People who divorce and remarry, oftentimes that marriage is way more likely to blow up than the first one because you bring your problems into that relationship as well. And maybe you were wronged and you had a right to remarry. And I'm not, if you weren't here for the sermon, you know that we have, God gave legitimate reasons to remarry. And that's not the point today. The point is we need to examine ourselves and look at ourselves before we start looking out and seeing here's all the problems are in the circumstances around me. I mean, we see it very obvious, don't we, with if you've ever worked children's ministry, if you've had kids, you know that when they're around the toddler age, and it keeps on for, unfortunately, too many years after this, that oftentimes, you know, the kid, he's playing with a toy, the other kid's playing with a toy, and the kid all of a sudden, he doesn't want his toy anymore, he wants that kid's toy because, you know, he thinks that will make him happy. And, you know, if you're a parent and sometimes we've done this, you know, an older child and has something and we just don't want to hear this kid whine. And so we take that toy. You know, you, could, you, you go do something else. All right. You go play. Let him do this because, you know, you just want this kid to shut up and be quiet. Right. And so you give that to them and it takes care of the problem for a few minutes. But pretty soon they're discontent and they're whining again about something else. And the more you feed into that, the worse they get. And it just creates this horrible cycle. And. We're just innate in us. Just We want something else to make us happy. We think that if we had this or achieved this, that that's going to fulfill us. But Paul tells Corinth that Christians, you know what? You don't need to seek after something else. We're one in Christ, and each believer should be content with the place that God has placed him or her in the life that God has given them. So don't envy other people's lives. Don't envy other people's spouses. Don't envy other people's children. Don't envy other people's jobs. Realize that God has put you where you are for a reason, and your life is God's assignment. Your life is God's assignment. Look at verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule 
in all the churches. So he says, see your life situation as a gift from God, an opportunity to advance the kingdom. And whatever that situation is, you can have fulfillment because the job that you're working is the job that God assigned to you. And your outward situation doesn't have to determine your satisfaction in the Lord. Now, obviously, if a, say, a prostitute came to, to Christ, you know, he would say, oh, continue in your occupation, or a guy who's robbing banks for a living, all right, continue to rob banks for the glory of God. You know, I mean, that, that's not what he's talking about, obviously, here. And so if they're in some kind of sinful occupation or situation, Paul's not advocating to stay in that. But he's saying you are where you are for a reason. And you don't have to change jobs or change spouses to find satisfaction. It comes down to our hearts. What are we seeking? And oftentimes we ask the wrong question. We say, what is God's will for, what do we say? My life. What is God's will for my life? And see, when we start out with that premise, we focus inevitably upon our life more than we do upon God. So the question I think we should ask is, what is God's will? And living in the will of God is more about knowing and trusting his promises than receiving specific directions. It's more about trusting God, trusting his word, being in his word, than saying, well, God, just show me, should I go to job A or job B? Or should I go to this school or that school? Or should I move here or move there? And while I'm not trying to downplay those big decisions that sometimes we have to make and we should seek in prayer, God's wisdom and his guidance. I would dare say that if you are truly seeking God with all your heart and pursuing him above everything else, I would say feel free to walk into A through A or B door. Go through either place because the bigger picture is not the circumstance or situation that you're in. The bigger thing is what are you going to do with A or B once you get there? Are you going to use that as a platform for God's kingdom or just to advance your career and make more money and hopefully find more happiness and contentment and comfort and pleasure. And so it's all about perspective. And the perspective has to be, God, I'm living for your glory, not my own glory. So not what's your will for my life, but what, what's your will, God? And I'm willing to walk in your principles and your truth. Now he turns in verse 18 to what like I said, a couple of the controversial issues of the day, which may seem insignificant and not re- unrelevant to us in this time, but it's actually not. Look at verse 18. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. If you know much about your Bible, you know that the Jewish people divided the world up into two groups. There was the circumcised group, those who loved God and worshipped God, the Jews, and those who were the heathens, the pagans. They called them the uncircumcised. And the church at Corinth would have been made up of both Jews that came to Christ and Gentiles that came to Christ. And you have these Judaizers, these people who came to Christ, but then they try to figure out, oh, What should I do with Judaism? Should I continue? Like, is is Christianity kind of an add-on to that? And so they were confused, and they began to try to tell the Roman, the Greek um, citizens, that they needed to be circumcised, keep the law of Moses in order to be right with God. And this became a big controversy in the early church. But believe it or not, there was a smaller group of people. While Paul mentions, you know, if someone's uh, uh, uncircumcised, don't seek to be uncircumcised. There was actually people, Jewish believers, who were seeking acceptance. Fill their cup, right? I'm I'm around all Greek people, so I need to appear like, you know, I'm with the times here and and can be relevant to my culture. And so they actually had surgical procedures to appear like they were uncircumcised. Don't ask me how people knew that stuff. I don't know. But anyway, um, this was kind of, you know, the defining line for Judaism. But Paul says, look at verse 19, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the law of God. Now, that's a pretty amazing thing right there, okay, what he just said. He declared that circumcision counts for nothing. What I just say, that was the mark, the definitive mark of Judaism was the fact that one was circumcised on the eighth day, a child. 
And for Jews, circumcision was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham and his ancestors and a tangible identifying marker that separated the Jews from the pagan world. And so for Paul to say that circumcision doesn't matter for anything, but he follows that with a little statement. What does he say that after that? What does he say after he says it doesn't matter for anything, but he says, but, verse 19, but keeping the commands of God. All right, follow me for a second, okay? Because this is, this is really good stuff to understand and know if you care about following Christ. Because sometimes you're going to get a question on this and get, have some confusion on this. The Jewish leaders saw circumcision as one of the most important commands. Because it even superseded the Sabbath laws because people were able to circumcise their child on the eighth day that fell on the Sabbath or Saturday. And you remember the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath day holy, was one of the Ten Commandments. So when Paul says, keep the commands of God, but he also says, circumcision doesn't matter for anything, what is he talking about there? He's saying, and one day we'll lay all this out in the book of Romans, because he talks at length in Romans. In Christ, there's this new sort of obedience to the commands, which has come into being through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. There's this, what Jesus talked about, the spirit of the law, versus just the letter of the law, that our hearts... What's your heart do? It's not just about conforming to external standards. It's about your heart. And so there's always been groups of Christians, and many of them for the right reasons, who struggle with, like, what do I do with the Old Testament laws? And what do I do with the commands? Because I want to please God. I want to make God happy. And all of these things were from God and, and for God. So should I obey the Mosaic law? Should I obey the food laws and all the ceremonial laws? And I believe scripture clearly shows that the prohibition against certain foods and as unclean, I think these were a temporary part of God's way of making Israel, his nation, distinct from the rest of the world. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. It's going to be up on the screen that you can follow along. Jesus said, and he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. So with the coming of Jesus, dramatic changes took place in the way that God deals with people. We're no longer a political, ethnic people like the Jews were, but a people of every tongue, tribe, and nation who come together with, as one to serve God and follow God. And so if you know people who tell you that, you know, you've got to eat certain things and not eat certain things, or you need to do this or do that, let me just caution you because there's nothing wrong with doing those things, but it doesn't raise you to a higher level of spirituality. It doesn't make you more mature in Christ. Look, I don't eat pork, plain and simple. I don't eat pork. Michelle and I haven't eaten pork for years, but I don't do it because I think that I'm more spiritual or I have a greater insight. I just do it, sorry if you're a pig farmer in here, but I do it because of health reasons. I don't think it's healthy for me. But as Christians, we're free to eat pork and we're free not to eat pork. When someone starts using these ceremonial laws or the dietary laws to push this higher maturity, they've crossed a line that contradicts Jesus and the New Testament. The Old Testament has been fulfilled Observances of the Old Covenant law are not required or even recommended for New Covenant believers. The New Testament, the New Covenant, the law of Christ gives us the commands needed to guide us into sanctification. Nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, the only exception being keeping the Sabbath day, which was a shadow of things to come. Colossians chapter 2 talks about that. So New Testament believers, you've been indwelled with the Holy Spirit and he gives us the ability to obey the commands of God. And so if you want to observe the old covenant laws and festivals and feasts, and you feel like that's something that's educational and, and helps you understand the significance of Christ better, do so. I've been to Passover. It's great. It's, it's very enlightening. I've been through presentations by groups like Jews for Jesus. And, and, and it was very, very educational. And I felt like I got a better understanding of how the Old Testament and New Testament fit together and prepare us for Christ. But if you're ever tempted to think that some way, somehow, that makes you closer to God, then I encourage you to go and read Hebrews and see that these things were all a shadow of something better, something greater, which is Jesus and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. 
And so Paul cautions them. He tells them when this was like the topic of the day, look, you don't need to do this. Be content. Your identity is in Jesus. It's not whether you get this marking or don't have this marking. It's not whether you identify with Judaism or not. It's in Christ. And then verse 21, he moves to a different area, which is controversial today, just like it was back then to some level. Verse 21, he says, Were you a bondservant or a slave when called? Do not be concerned about that. Really? Don't be concerned? He says, but if you have an opportunity to gain your freedom, definitely take advantage of that. Verse 22, for he who has called, was, who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freeman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. Kind of like when we talked about lawsuits in the church, and he said, look, it's better to be taken advantage of than to sue your brother or sister in Christ. He's saying, look, if you are a slave, and there were lots of slaves in the Roman world, he said, look, this doesn't prohibit you from being able to serve God. He said, sure, if your master offers you freedom, by all means, go for it. But you don't have to have freedom in order to serve God. Because your identity isn't a slave. Your identity is, I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. And while it would be obviously a challenge for one to be a slave under a master who wasn't really a great master and wasn't a Christian, or it might have been tougher even as a, a, somebody who was a Christian who treated them well, because why is this brother in Christ keeping me as a slave? Why doesn't he give me his freedom? But Paul says... It's not about those things. He's not writing an essay here on the evils of slavery, as we know slavery is evil and it's terrible. And much to the, wor uh, the work for Christians in the 19th century, devout Christians who saw slavery as the evil it was, and abolishment was a direct result of biblical understanding. That Paul isn't, that's not the issue he's talking about here. He's trying to show us that regardless of the situation that you're in, you can serve Christ. You can make a difference for him. Sure, society may look at you as a slave and think of you as a second-class, third-class citizen. They may walk by you and show you no respect. But you know what Paul says? Just like the cup illustration. You don't have to worry about that person filling your cup because they treat you as if you're a nothing, as a piece of property. Because you don't need them to fill your cup because God and your identity in Christ is the one who fills your cup. And so you can joyfully find satisfaction even in the worst of situations because Christ is in you and Christ is the one filling you up. That's pretty radical, isn't it? And so lest you, know, you think earlier on that, wow, you know, if you knew my boss, you would know that it's probably impossible to live as a Christian there. You, know, it's like, you just don't get it. Well, I can assure you, no matter what your job is like, it's better than the slave and what he had. It. And Paul said, you can, you, you can live for Jesus there. And back to the issue of marriage. You know, sure, that sounds good, but you just don't understand the crazy woman I'm married to, or this guy, how, just how selfish he is. Paul says, God's assignment, he's put you there. Be faithful. Do what he's asked you to do, because that marriage, that job is not your identity. Your identity is Christ. One thing I did not add last week, that a lady came and talked to me afterwards, and I didn't mention that if somebody is in an abusive situation, get out, okay? Get out. Um, Chris Beam sitting right here, I would go and find him or an elder or a deacon this morning and say, look, I'm in, a, I'm in a situation where I'm getting beat up, I'm getting hit, I need help. And trust me, we will encourage you to separate from that person and for them to get help and you to get help. But because the text wasn't speaking that directly last week, I didn't mention that. But I do want to bring that up today. But Paul says, in these situations we're in, God has put us there. And if you're free, you shouldn't enslave yourself to someone else. He says the opposite, which we find that hard to believe, right? Like, why would a free person become a slave? But actually, during the Roman time, there were some people who were so in debt in other circumstances that they actually became a slave because there was more security in that than there was in the fact that they were free. But Paul says, 
Look, if you get the chance, get the freedom, but it's not about the freedom. Don't spend all your waking hours trying to see how you're going to find freedom. Spend your time, spend your energy on what God has called you to do, which is glorify him and to keep his commandments. Verse 23, where we started off, he says, You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So Paul moves from speaking about literal slavery here to a spiritual metaphor where he says, look, it's not about the identity the world gives you. It's not about what people think about you. It's not about how they judge you because of the car you drive or the job you have or how much education you have. Those things don't matter. What matters is God has put you where he's put you. And you seek him and pursue him above all else. He's going to take care of some of those things that need maybe some tweaking. He's going to allow you to pursue greater education for his glory more than likely. He's going to allow you to find fulfillment in your job at some level. Because when you do it for him, it changes the perspective. It changes the perspective. So you don't belong to yourself anymore as a Christian. I don't belong to myself anymore as a Christian. We were bought with a price. But God owns us. And again, the situation, the location, the circumstances of your life don't matter as much. What matters is the fact that you're on assignment from God. Be content where God has placed you. Abide in Christ. And watch what he can do through you. Incredible, incredible passage of scripture. I pray that if you're in a situation, in a marriage, in a job, even in a location, that you think, you know what? I just can't serve God here. If I have this, then I can serve God. I encourage you to go reread this, reevaluate your life, see what really you're putting up there as your highest priorities. And God will change our thinking. Let's pray. Father God, your word definitely challenges us. God, just being faithful to your word allows us to see things from your perspective in, in areas that we probably would never even consider or think about on our own. And God, I pray that you'll encourage each believer in here to have the, the passion, the discipline to seek you every day on their own, to be reading your word, to be getting your perspective on life, God. Because left to ourselves, we do seek what only you can give us through other people and through jobs and through activities and comfort. And God, you say that you are the only one that can give the living water that can satisfy. We take you at your word. We believe you. And God, may we authenticate that through our actions this week by making the time to spend with you, to go to your throne, and to see you bigger and larger than we've ever seen you before. And God, help us to trust you. Before I finish the prayer, I'd just like the band to come up and just take a second, just reflect, because I don't want us to walk out of here and more knowledge with no application doesn't mean discipleship. What is God prompting you as application through this? Before you get up in the morning and head to work, do you need to get God's perspective on your job? That person that works in the cubicle next to you, do you need to begin to see them as someone who needs Jesus, needs a savior, not as somebody to join in with gossip and just having fun with? There's so many areas of our life where we put us on the throne rather than God. Let's, let's put him in our lives where he is anyway, which is the throne. Let's, let's continue prayer. God, we pray that these decisions, these things that we've decided we need to do as a result of this message will not just be warm and fuzzy feelings, but help them to be things that we place into action. God, we love you and we thank you and help us to get a bigger view of you in all that we do in Jesus' name.